Good morning, faithful listener. You are listening to the Bible Explained podcast, where the Bible gets explained. So grab your cup of coffee and stay tuned as we read through the book of Luke. Hello and good morning, friends and faithful listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Bible Explained podcast on this lovely Tuesday morning. Today, we're going to be talking about the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane, <laughs> Gethsemane and Jesus battling in the Garden of Gethsemane. But before we get to that, you're going to notice in the bio of this podcast episode that I have my contact information on there. That is my email, my work email. And if you have a prayer request, please email me. Please tell me that prayer request and I'll write you down in my little journal. And also I have a really exciting announcement. My sister is uh, going to be helping me more than she used to. She used to come on the podcast once a month or so, and we would do an episode together. But she is going to be helping me even more, and she's going to be taking over the blog on the P40 Ministries website. So that's something you can look forward to is more blog posts. And my sister is an excellent writer. She is an English major. And that doesn't mean I might not write a blog post here and there. But now the blog is going to be updated much more often with good content, good topical content regarding uh, the Bible. So be looking forward to that. If you haven't subscribed to the website yet, go over there and put your email into the subscribe box. And you will also receive two free chapters of my book, Out of the Mire. So definitely go do that while you have a chance. And also that'll help you stay updated for all the blog posts that will be coming in over the next few weeks. But anyway, faithful listeners, let's read Luke 22 verses 39 through 53 today. Grab your Bible or your cup of coffee or your cup of tea. And let's go ahead and start reading this. I'll be reading out of the W.E.B. as I always do. Jesus came out and went, as his custom was, to the Mount of Olives. His disciples also followed him. When he was at the place, he said to them, pray that you don't enter into temptation. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he rose up from his prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping because of grief. And he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise up and pray that you might not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd appeared. He who is called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He came near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? When those who were around him saw what was about to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? A certain one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered, Let me at least do this. And he touched the ear and healed him. Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come against him, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you in the temple daily, you didn't stretch out your hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. I'm going to be honest, in the next few weeks as we start talking about Jesus's death, I'm going to be getting more and more emotional because every single time I end up talking about Jesus's death, I get very teary. And even this today, reading it, I was starting to get a little teary. So forgive me for that. However, I do find that it's probably an appropriate response when we're seeing um, how awful our Savior's death really was. But okay, in verse 39, this is actually a very important verse, the very beginning of this. It says, he came out and went, as his custom was, to the Mount of Olives. And obviously, this is talking about Jesus. So he was at the Passover supper, and he started walking to the Mount of Olives, as was his custom. This means that it was a habit for Jesus, a custom. It was something he did regularly, if not every single night. He would walk to the Mount of Olives and pray. So this was his custom to do this. And why this is such an important verse is because Judas would have known this. And Jesus was not hiding in any sense. He didn't go to the Mount of Olives to hide. And Luke makes it very clear that no, Jesus was not hiding. In fact, this was his regular routine to go to the Mount of Olives to pray. It was his custom. You would think that um, any other person that knew that they were going to die would try to remove themselves from that situation as quick as possible, right? Like, for example, I just saw a trailer on Netflix where a person saw that a volcano had exploded 
And in order to get away from the ash that was coming towards them, because that stuff can kill you, they jumped in their car and started going as fast as they possibly can to get away from that like smoke cloud of ash that was coming towards them. So yeah, I mean, you try to remove yourself from a situation if you know you're, you're going to die. That's the human response to something bad that is about to happen to you. But Jesus didn't do that because Jesus was not just human. He was also God. He knew the past, present, and the future. He could see the big picture. So yes, even though Jesus had to die momentarily, in that moment, I mean, he was looking forward to the glory that he was going to receive through this. And that's the fact that everyone on earth would have access to salvation through Jesus's sacrifice for humanity. So they get to the place and Jesus says, pray that you don't enter into temptation because some of his disciples were with him. His disciples also followed him. So he says, pray that you don't enter into temptation. And I think what Jesus is saying by this is the disciples are about to go through a very extended period of time where they're going to be tempted to do the wrong thing, right? As Jesus uh, is betrayed and captured, the disciples are going to become afraid. And Jesus absolutely knows this. So he says, pray here that you don't enter into temptation to do something wrong. And I do wonder, I do wonder that if the disciples, if they would have listened to Jesus in this and had prayed that they not enter into temptation, I do wonder if things would have played out a little bit differently for the disciples. So we see how important prayer is here, that Jesus commands his disciples to pray that they not enter into temptation, but then Jesus himself goes and prays also. But I do think that there was a struggle going on for sure, as we're going to see in the next few verses, where Jesus may or may not have been tempted to walk away from the sacrifice he was about to make. So Jesus himself goes and prays. I believe that Jesus really does make his decision about going to the cross right here and now in the garden of Gethsemane. (laughs) I don't know why I can't say that word. But in this garden, I do believe that Jesus is making his final decision that he is going to, in fact, go to the cross and save humanity. And it was probably a very hard decision or rather a hard thing for Jesus to have to go through. I mean, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine it. You know, Jesus knowing that this terrible thing was going to happen to him, that he was going to become the sacrifice and not just experience death, but I think experience something much greater than death. I don't think the death was the big thing that Jesus was worried about because Jesus obviously understood life after death, right? I don't think Jesus would have been nearly as concerned when it came to going to the cross if it was just death and that was the only thing involved i think there was something much more that jesus had to encounter and had to go through as being the sacrifice for humanity and i don't really know what that is a lot of people like to say that jesus went to hell um to like conquer something down there i don't know if that's the case it doesn't actually say in scripture that jesus went to hell it doesn't specifically say that um but it does say that Jesus had to experience God's wrath. So we don't know if that means that Jesus went to hell to go um, conquer something that had to be conquered there, or if this just meant that for many hours, Jesus would have to experience complete and total separation and judgment from God himself, his father. And we know that when God is away from people, when God detaches himself from people, this like darkness, this terrible darkness is in their lives. And I guess some people do say that that could be hell because many people do believe, including myself, actually, that hell is just a complete and total separation from God the Father. So, I mean, I don't know if Jesus went to hell or not, but he clearly experienced something much greater than death and probably to a much larger extent than really anybody else would ever whatever Jesus ends up going through here. And I think that's why he struggles so much here in the garden, because here's what it says. He tells his disciples to pray, right? And then it says he walks about a stone's throw away from the disciples. And I never picked up on that before, that Jesus was not far from his disciples at all. 
when he starts praying to God the Father. And that was something that always kind of confused me where I was like, I wonder how the disciples knew what Jesus was talking about um, when he was praying in the garden. Because when we get into the book of John, we're going to find out that John gives these really long and in-depth prayers that Jesus was saying in the garden of Gethsemane. And I was always like, I wonder how John knew that. Maybe Jesus told him. Maybe uh, (laughs) he just had inspiration from God. But the fact is, Jesus is not far from his disciples at all. It says he was a stone's throw away. So that means very short distance away to the point where the disciples could both see him and probably hear him. So it says he kneels down to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So Jesus is asking, Father, remove this cup from me. We often see like cups in the Old Testament, describing God the Father's wrath, like the cup of wrath. And so Jesus is asking his father, please remove the cup of wrath. And this is where I say once again, that Jesus experienced something far greater than death. What, Whatever this means, the cup of wrath that he had to endure was probably excruciatingly terrible. So he asks the father, if there's any other way that I can do this, that I can still help people that I can still help them attain salvation through my sacrifice, but not have to deal with this cup of wrath. Please do that. If there's any other way. And clearly there was no other way because Jesus had to do it. But yet Jesus is imploring and asking his father to help him through this and to help him potentially not have to experience this terrible cup of wrath that maybe he can do this some other way. Because Jesus cared so much about humanity. He loved us. He loved you so much that he was willing to do this in the garden, to kneel down and to say these words to his father so that he could give you salvation. So then um, Jesus was very emotional here. And he says, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So he says, if there's no other way, I'm, st- I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it, Father, if there's no other way for this to be done. So there, Jesus makes his decision right there in the garden that he is, in fact, going to go to the cross and is going to experience that wrath, that cup of wrath, so that you and I don't have to experience it. So then Jesus is on the point. The brink of death is actually what it said. He was so distraught that he was like on the brink of death. And it says here in verse 43, an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And here's the thing about this. The disciples weren't far away. They likely could hear a lot, if not most of what Jesus was saying, even though at this point in time, maybe they were falling asleep. But they could probably hear what was happening. They knew Jesus was in great distress, right? I mean, they absolutely knew that because of what we're going to see here in a moment. But they didn't go and comfort Jesus. And I do kind of wonder about that. They didn't go and uh, try to help him or anything. They just kind of freaked out themselves. So an angel has to come do it. One of God's servants comes and strengthens Jesus. But Jesus yet, he's still in agony. It says, but being in agony, he prays more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. So all of this was through an eyewitness. These disciples saw this happening to Jesus. And I've heard people say that Jesus basically sweat blood, but that's not actually what it says. His sweat was like blood, not that it was blood. However, I looked this up and apparently... It is possible to sweat blood. <laughs> um, when people get very distressed, sometimes their their uh, capillaries, I guess, can break and they can sweat blood in a sense. So that could have been what was happening here, or it could have just meant that uh, Jesus was just in so much agony that he's just pouring down sweat. And I know for me, when I get really anxious, I actually do sweat a lot. <laughs> I get very hot and sweaty and uncomfortable. And uh, you will know this if you <laughs> if you know me personally. 
anytime that I lead worship, I don't care. It doesn't matter how much deodorant I put on. I sweat through the deodorant and I smell terrible after I lead worship or if I get really stressed out. That's just my thing. I sweat. And so my husband is just like, holy cow, like, Jen, you need new deodorant. I'm like, I'm telling you, I put deodorant on. I don't know why this happens to me. <laughs> but anyway, yes, I sweat when I get very anxious. And that's a, a natural human response, probably for many of us is when we get anxious or very distressed, we are going to sweat. And that's kind of what happens to Jesus. It says that his sweat became like great drops of blood, like it was pouring out of him practically like blood pours out of a person. So then after this, he rises up from his prayer and he came to his disciples. And we find out from other accounts of this, that this happened a handful of times, actually, where Jesus came and checked on his disciples and found them sleeping each time because they were so distraught. That's what happened. It says they were sleeping because of grief. That's another thing, actually, that I do. When I get really depressed, I get very sleepy and I want to just sleep. And Um, Once again, another human response to stress and anxiety. His disciples were clearly very distraught over what was happening with Jesus, seeing Jesus in that state, knowing that something was very wrong, not quite understanding what exactly was wrong, but knowing that their teacher, their Messiah, their God was distressed to this great capacity. And so they become very distressed themselves and they fall asleep. So Jesus says, why do you sleep? Rise up and pray. Jesus is saying, praying right now is more important than sleep. Praying, you got to pray that you do not enter into temptation. This is the second time Jesus says this. And perhaps if the disciples would have listened to Jesus and prayed that they not enter into temptation, perhaps they would have been strengthened for what comes next. And maybe they wouldn't have deserted Jesus at Jesus's time to go be crucified. We don't know. But that's not what happens. They don't pray, or at least they did very little praying, it sounds like. And they did, in fact, enter into that temptation, specifically Peter, to abandon Jesus in his moment of need. So while Jesus was still speaking, it says, this crowd appears Other versions might say a multitude. And Judas was in this multitude. He was one of the 12. We remember Judas. (laughs) Good old Judas Iscariot. He's not very good. But uh, he was leading this multitude to come and capture Jesus. And Jesus, I I mean, don't forget, it's dark outside. This is the nighttime. And Jesus was not a very unique looking person from my understanding or at least this kind of makes it seem like Je- Jesus is not super unique looking. He looked very ordinary. So Judas had to let the multitude, the, the crowds know which one of the disciples Jesus was. So he comes up and kisses Jesus. And this was like an ordinary greeting of a kiss. This was common. Um, people in Europe still do this to this day. I um, have some friends from the Netherlands who kiss me on the cheeks when they see me. So, yeah, I mean, a very common thing to do back in these days, though Americans don't touch each other. (laughs) We just give a quick handshake and we're like, okay, leave me alone now. But Judas kisses Jesus to betray him. And Jesus says to Judas, Judas, do you betray the son of man with a kiss? Like this is this is pretty crappy of you. I think is kind of what Jesus is saying. And plus, on top of that, it was showing that Jesus already knew everything. And maybe Judas somehow didn't know (laughs) or somehow maybe didn't realize that Jesus knew exactly what was happening here. So Jesus is calling Judas out. So then the disciples see this all happen and they're like, Lord, we're going to strike with the sword because they've got those two swords. Remember? And it says a certain one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. (laughs) Ah, we know that that's Peter. John gives Peter away in the next uh, the next book. So Peter cuts off the high priest's servant's ear. So Jesus is like, no, stop. And we talked about um, the swords the other day. So if you want to hear that episode, it's called Should Christians Arm Themselves? You can go and listen to that one. I'll actually try to find it and link it in the bio of this podcast episode. But anyway, Peter cuts off the ear. So Jesus 
performs his last miracle before he dies. He touches the ear and heals the servant. And I do wonder what that servant thought. I wonder what happened there. It doesn't say. But either way, at this point, Jesus is now captured. And Jesus asks this multitude of people that have come to capture him, because there was a bunch of people there. There was uh, guards and Roman soldiers all there to capture Jesus, because they were trying to, I'm going to guess, not have a riot on their hands, because rioting was kind of popular back in these days, <laughs> as it is now, I suppose. But um, Jesus is like, I was in the temple every single day, and yet you didn't lay a finger on me. And he's like, why now do you come to the garden? Why do you do this? And he says, it's because this is your hour and the power of darkness. And that's how Jesus ends this. So basically, it's the hour of darkness is kind of what Jesus is alluding to here. And we're going to see that that's truly the case because when Jesus is on the cross, the sun is gone. It truly is the hour of darkness. But really, this is the reason Jesus came down to earth. And even though it is so sad, it's so depressing to read these things in scripture. We do know that there is hope. We know that Jesus is going to be coming back. This is not the end of him. So guys, if you liked this episode, please share it on your social media accounts. Also, click the links in the bio of this podcast episode and subscribe to each thing, including the YouTube channel and the website. And also check out my book, The Adore Devotional for Teenage Girls, which I will also link in the description here of this podcast episode. And you can navigate over there and check out the brand new devotional that I wrote for teenage girls about Advent. Advent is just around the corner. So I encourage you guys to get your books now if you want them on time. But friends, I will see you bright and early tomorrow morning for an episode out of Deuteronomy. Until then, happy listening and God bless.